Okay, welcome. So, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, like ordering of the chapters for the textbook, we're actually moving back a little bit. And this isn't going to be like a word-for-word -word sort of like retread of what you're reading in that chapter. This is going to be a little different. Now, at the end of the day, the, the gist of what we're covering is going to be the same. I'm just kind of going about it in a slightly different way. Because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be learning about analyzing time series econometrics results to be able to test the real business cycle model to see if it's really a good model or if it's crap or if it's kind of in between or maybe it's really good in one context and really bad in another. So, um, well, let's get started. So what is a time series? Well, it's a variable that evolves over time and has one observation for each time period. So if you're looking at something like inflation, we could have CPI and PCE inflation. This would be an example of a time series. It runs, in this case, from 1985 up, up until 2020. Um, now, I mean, the you know, both CPI and PCE have been recorded since 2020. It's just, you know, figured, now what the hell, just here's an example of a time series. Um, there's one observation per time period for each one. So if you're looking at, like, monthly or quarterly data, there's only one recorded data point for each time period. So if it's quarterly, well, you know, Q1 2020, Q2 2020, Q3 2020, things like that. Now, what we're going to be interested in here is what's known as an autoregressive process. Um, it's an equation that runs on a lag of itself or more lags of itself plus error. So it's like saying past behavior predicts future behavior mostly but not perfectly. Now, the name autoregressive uh, comes because auto, well, like terms of itself, and regressive because this is a regression. If you've taken statistics and you remember linear regression, that's all this is. It's just a linear regression that is fit in terms of itself, namely past values of itself. Now, you could have one lag, so it's like what happened yesterday plays a role in what happened today, but what happened two days ago doesn't directly play a role in what happened today. You could have two lags where what happened yesterday and two days ago plays a role in what happens today. You could have three lags, four lags, really as many as you want that the data can feasibly allow. Now, an autoregressive process would look something like what you see here. So y equals a0 plus a1 times yt minus 1 plus epsilon t. y would be like the output, right? In this case, you could think of it as like GDP. And it would be predicted by alpha naught plus alpha one times y t minus one. So that alpha naught, that's like a constant. If you remember slope intercept form, if you look at just the first two terms on the right hand side of this equation, this is like slope intercept form y equals mx plus b. So this a naught is b, that's the intercept. Alpha one, well, that's your slope. That's going to tell you the relationship between the past value of y and the current value of y. And then this epsilon right here, this is the error. This is the, the residual. It's what can't be explained by the lags of yt. Now, the first two terms, that alpha naught plus alpha 1 times yt minus 1, and that term epsilon t are what's known as orthogonal, meaning they're uncorrelated. So if something were to happen to one of them, it's not going to affect the other at all. It's actually one of the benefits of using um, this type of estimation is that the regressors and the residual term are uncorrelated with one another. It's actually something that's very nice that we'll be um, exploiting a little bit when we generalize this AR process to multiple variables. So let's say that, you know, we're moving along this process, this AR process for some amount of time, and somebody comes along and they spike that error term by some positive amount. So what's happening is they're shocking the equation. And when they shock that equation, well, it's going to feed through the rest of the equation, right? Now you're like, well, I thought you just said they were uncorrelated. I did. The regressor, the stuff on the right-hand side, and this epsilon are uncorrelated. But if this epsilon goes up, this yt goes up. And if this yt goes up, well, in the next period, when we move forward one period, 
this now becomes yt over here, and we got a yt plus 1 over here. Well, this yt increased because the epsilon increased at the, pre the period before. So it increases the equation overall, and it will eventually decrease again. It'll eventually return, hopefully, back to its original value, or at least something close to its original value, or it'll return to, like, some steady state, whether it's the original steady state or a new one. Now, as we trace out what happens to that, we get what's known as an impulse response function, and it's like really useful in economics because it looks at how a time series variable responds to a shock. Maybe this is starting to sound kind of familiar because you're like, we've learned about shocks to economic systems all semester. We've looked at technology shocks. We've looked at like what human capital shocks. We've talked about labor supply shocks. We've talked about monetary and fiscal policy shocks. Now we get to actually analyze all of that, not just in a theoretical, let's trace out a demand curve and all that, but we actually get to look at real world data and we can see how these two match up. So, well, here's something shocking for you. Paula Dean writing to Hindenburg, why the hell not? Okay, so it's no secret that I like NyQuil. And so let's say I wanna look at NyQuil consumption over time. Now, if we were to look at my NyQuil consumption over time, it might have a little bit of an issue. It might be kind of scary because you know, you'd end up seeing like these guys sitting in the corner just staring at you making, weird faces, and maybe they're even talking to you. I don't know. Um, but let's say I want to look at how NyQuil consumption for a lot of people responds when they get a cold. So let's say we go into like, you know, December, January, February, and a lot of people are getting colds. They're getting sick. They're not feeling that great. What are they going to do? Well, they're going to take NyQuil. Now, are they going to keep taking NyQuil or not? Well, if they keep taking NyQuil, again, it just turns into what we see right here. That's, you know, nightmare fuel in and of itself. But let's say, okay, we got just quantity of NyQuil that we're looking at. What happens? Well, people get sick. We get a cold, right? Everybody gets sick at some point. Now, as that happens, well, the quantity of NyQuil is going to increase. We're going to use more and more NyQuil. Now, eventually, we're either going to see this and go, oh my God, it's time to stop drinking NyQuil, or we're going to go, hey, I'm starting to feel better. It's probably a, a combination of the two, a nice linear combination of those two types there. Either way, NyQuil consumption sort of begins to fall, and it falls and falls and falls and falls and falls. Thus, what we're looking at is the evolution of the response of NyQuil consumption to a bunch of people getting a cold over time. Let's say this is 35 days. So over the course of 35 days, a lot of people will eventually stop their use of NyQuil, and it'll kind of return back to zero. So that's what this green curve is telling me. What are these things around it? Well, these are like credibility bands. It's, this is a, actually drawn from a Bayesian model. So these are Bayesian credibility bands. Um, that's really more for the other nerds that are watching this class, uh, this lecture. Um, uh, not necessarily people directly enrolled in the course. So what are those? Well, if you've taken statistics and you remember like confidence intervals or like confidence bands, things like that, that's basically what this is here. It's just really... It's describing a distribution of the behavior. So if we're looking at this, right? So let's say we're looking at this peak here. So this is what, about seven and a half days after people get sick. That's when the NyQuil consumption is going to peak. It's got to be a really bad flu or a cold or something. Well, these upper bands, I'm not too worried about that here. I'm really more worried about these lower bands. And the reason I'm worried about these lower bands is because this guy is going above zero. So if it's going above zero, the next thing you want to ask yourself is, okay, are these lower bands also above zero? Because if they are, then we can be fairly confident that we're actually seeing an increase. Because remember, this is statistics. We don't know for sure what's actually happening. This is really just based on the data and based on the model that is generated by the data. It's not going to be a perfect measure. We don't know for sure. You'll never know anything for sure with statistics. It's really just kind of best guess based on evidence. So what's this evidence telling us? Well, the evidence is telling us that because these two bands, so this is like a 68% confidence interval, so to speak, and this would be like a 95% confidence interval. So the solid line, the really dark shaded area, at 68%, and the not quite so shaded area that's a little bit broader, that's a 95%. So if you think of this as like a distribution, this is like 
you know, one standard deviation out, this could be like two standard deviations out or something like that. So you're getting a little bit more of that distribution. So if you're looking at either the 68 or 95% confidence intervals, now I'm using that in Bayesian credibility bands interchangeably when maybe I necessarily shouldn't be, but if you just think of it as a confidence interval, what that can tell us is that we're pretty sure, we're reasonably certain that we have an actual increase. Now, if, say, this confidence band, or this, this Bayesian credibility band, whatever, if either of these were below zero, so this increases, but this band here, let's take this really thick one, let's say that goes below zero, so it's like where this mouse is down here. Well, that's saying a lot of my draws are above zero, and a lot of them are below zero, and you can't really say one way or the other what's going on, and you would have to, let's say, alter or adjust our comfort levels in how wrong or right we might be in order to make a claim that we probably shouldn't be making in that case. However, if this band right here is above zero when the this little green curve here is also above zero, then we can be fairly certain that we had a significant response. So here, consumption increases, and it peaks you know, around the time the pink elephants show up, or people just start feeling better. I don't know. Either way, they're going to stop taking NyQuil. But the thing is, this doesn't tell me that much. Yeah, it tells me about changes in the consumption of NyQuil, but it's just that. It's a change in consumption. If we want to be economists, right, we got to go, all right, well, there's the change in quantity, but what about the change in price? Because if we're looking at, like, demand or supply of these things, well, we have to have a change in the price, which, last I checked, isn't in this impulse response function. So we got ourselves a little bit of an identification problem. And what would that be? Well, the quantity is increasing. But if you just look at the quantity increasing, is that a demand shock or is that a supply shock? We don't know. Why don't we know? Well, we don't know because we don't know what the price is doing. So if the quantity goes up and the price also goes up, that would be indicative of a demand shock. Because if you just draw you know, supply and demand and you shift demand out, price goes up, quantity goes up. But we're looking at this quantity increase. What if the price went down? Well, that would be indicative of a supply shock because for a supply shock, output and price move in opposite directions, not the same direction. So by looking at this, we don't know which one it could be, and it could be either one because there's not enough information. We can't identify these shocks all that well, hence there's an identification problem. Not good. So it doesn't make sense to just look at one variable. Like I was saying, for supply and demand stuff, we need two equations. You need supply and demand, and you can't identify two shocks from one equation. If you remember systems of equations from uh, like college algebra or algebra two when you're in high school, if you have two equations and two unknowns and you can solve for it, right? You're good. You can get both unknowns. But if you've got two unknowns in one equation, you can't uniquely solve for both of them. You can uniquely solve for one, but the other one will be in terms of the other variable. That's not very good. So we want them uniquely identified. So we need to look at two equations. If I want to understand supply and demand fluctuations for the NyQuil market. So now I'm going to have two equations, output and price. So the, what we're doing now is the equation for y now has a lag of y and p, or price. And the same goes for the price. The equation for price has lags of output and price in it. So this is still an autoregression model, but we have a vector of these equations, hence the name vector autoregression. And this is going to be giving us an equilibrium for the NyQuil market. So originally I had what's just in black, y equals a naught plus a1 times yt minus 1 plus epsilon t. Okay, now what I'm doing is I'm suppressing that intercept, that alpha naught. We're just going to pretend that that's just not there. Why? Well, just to make it easier so you can see what the equations are doing. So now I've got y equals alpha 1, 1 times yt minus 1 plus alpha 1, 2 times pt minus 1 plus epsilon yt. So that is output being a function of the lag of output and a lag of price. 
And the price equation is alpha 2, 1 times yt minus 1 plus alpha 2, 2 times pt minus 1 plus epsilon pt. So price is a function of the lag of output and the lag of price. So if the lag of price goes up, well, that'll increase the price in the next period, right? But is pt minus 1 and pt minus 1, they're the same. So if this goes up, this also goes up. And when this goes up, well, it's going to go up by alpha 1, 2, whatever that amount is, and that's going to increase output in the next period as well. So if you change one, one term, then you're going to be changing both equations. And that's really, really, really useful for us. We'll see why in a minute. But this is really about to be giving us an equilibrium for the NyQuil market. And because we've got these residuals here, this epsilon yt and epsilon pt, we can also get a set of impulse responses. Now, the thing is, output and price are endogenous to each other. So what this means is that if you were to look at a shock to one equation, you'd get elements from both supply and demand shocks in your impulse responses. And you're probably going like, well, isn't that what you're supposed to have? Well, no, not really. Um, we want to make sure that one equation, one of these equations, gives us demand, and the other one gives us supply, and that's it. I don't want, like, if we're going to say, hey, this is demand here, that's cool, but if I get a demand shock, I want it to come purely from this equation. I don't want parts of this equation showing up in this equation, and it's happening because of these residual terms. These residual terms, right, this is orthogonal to this, right? So this part and this part are orthogonal, just like this part and this part are orthogonal to each other. But here's the thing. This part and this part, these two guys aren't orthogonal to each other, and they need to be. Because until then, if you're looking at a demand shock, you're getting possibly elements of a supply shock and vice versa. So I need to impose a little bit of structure on it. Because currently, this is what's known as a reduced form, and I want a structural form. These are just raw, like, contemporaneous correlations. If I can impose some structure to it, though, I can maybe get a little bit of inference in terms of, like, say, the causal ordering of shocks. So how do we do that? Well, if you remember from microeconomics, because remember, macroeconomics is just micro with a twist, basically. It's micro with a T subscript instead of an I subscript. Demand is a function of output and price, and supply is a function of only price. So here's the cool thing. From just those two bullet points right there, I actually have enough information to put this guy into a structural form. So I can allow for a set of like contemporaneous, like meaningful con contemporaneous relationships where demand is a contemporaneous function of output and price, and supply is only a function of price. So, it tells me I need to estimate equations 1 and equation 2. And really all I need to do is just estimate these two equations right here, and then do a little bit of algebra to get this. Because all the information I need is in here, it's just not in the form it needs to be yet. So if I subtract this alpha naught p times pt, from both sides. Well, I get this over here, but let's look at this part for a second. So what is this telling me? Well, this is telling me output and price are contemporaneously related in equation, well, I guess one, in the pink equation one. All right, here, price is only contemporaneous related. Well, I guess with only price, nothing else. So of these two, which one's demand, which one's supply? Well. We go back here, demand's a function of output and price. Output, price. So this pink equation here is demand. The purple is supply. So the top equation, this guy, is demand, and this is now supply. Now again, you still just want yt and pt on this side. If you've got any kind of contemporaneous relationship going on, it needs to be on the right-hand side, not the left-hand side of the equation. But 
I guess that's neither here nor there. What this is telling me, this is demand because, well, output and price contemporaneously are related to each other. Here, price and, well, no output are contemporaneously related with each other. So the pink is demand, the purple is supply. Now, don't worry about having to back any of this stuff out. You don't have to do that. I'm not going to quiz you on this. I'm not going to make you do it. I just kind of want you to get an idea as to what we're actually looking at and why, if I'm saying something is demand, why it is demand. So, okay. So in a static framework, if I'm looking at just one point in time, if I want to look at a demand shock, this is what I'm going to get. You get an increase in demand. So we go from D1 up to D2. The equilibrium point is going to go from Y1, P1 up to Y2, P2. Output and price both increase. So if output and price are both going up, well, it's got to be a demand shock because that downward sloping demand is shifting along an upward sloping supply. So if we trace out the equilibrium points, we get an increase in output and price. Supply shock, on the other hand, supply is shifting along the downward sloping demand curve. So if we go from S1 to S2, so supply is shifting out, we go from an equilibrium P1 or Y1, P1 over to Y2, P2. Now Y output increases, but the price level falls. So when output increases and prices fall, that's going to be indicative of a supply shock. So if you just remember those two things, you're going to be in pretty good shape for the next things that are coming in the course. Namely this, next thing that comes in the lecture even. In a dynamic framework, this is what a demand shock is. Now, how do we know this is a demand shock? Well, what we're doing is, if you remember your steady states from earlier in this course, right? Think of everything before this T0. So this is like T equals 0, 5, 10. This is monthly data that we'll say. Or actually, this is daily data because we're looking at NyQuil. So in the days leading up to when the shock hits it, T equals 0. Think of everything as just running along a flat line. So look at what this mouse is doing, right? This mouse is just moving along a flat line, and then boom, T equals 0. People get sick. They have to buy NyQuil. So if they have to buy NyQuil, well, the price of NyQuil is going to increase. Why is the price of NyQuil going to increase? Because the quantity of NyQuil also increases. So we're looking at the percent deviation. Think of this as a percent deviation from steady state. So people get sick, they want more NyQuil. So the quantity of NyQuil increases. Now, as the quantity of NyQuil increases, because more people went out and bought them, well, the price of NyQuil is going to go up. Price is a rationing mechanism. So because price is a rationing mechanism, if there's less of the stuff, the price of it's going to go up. Therefore, the quantity increases, the price increases. Now, eventually, it kind of levels off, and we sort of go back to essentially zero, really after about two weeks, because... If we're looking at this 95% Bayesian credibility band after two weeks, it crosses zero and it no longer becomes significant. We can't tell whether this green curve is actually significantly different from zero or not. So people are sick for about two weeks and they get better and then everything kind of returns back to normal. That's what this is telling me. So if you look, okay, well, look along the vertical axis here, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3, 0 0.4. Okay, so this is increasing as you go up. Right? Well, it has to because you know, you're going up, so it's increasing. So this is positive. This is also positive, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15. Now, if it were negative, you'd be seeing like, you know, 0 0.1 uh, or negative 0.1, negative 0 0.05, negative 0 0.01, something like that until you get to zero, and then it starts increasing again. So look at this vertical axis. Always look at the vertical axis to tell whether this is going up or down. Now, generally speaking... We're primarily interested in, just in general, does it go up or does it go down? Well, you can look at this and think, okay, well, it looks like it's going down, right? It goes up and then it goes down. But just look at, is this above or below zero? That's what I really want to know. That's the most important thing here. This is above zero, well, because if you look at, like, the maximum impact, right, the maximum response, it's about five days after people start getting sick. That maximum deviation from zero is about 0.3, so it went up. Over here, what's the maximum deviation? Well, it's about 10 days after before the quantity really kind of starts to fall again. 
maybe eight days, we'll say. What is that? Well, that's about 0.23% above steady state. So this also went up. Now, you'll be like, well, it looks like it went down. Yeah, it goes up and it goes down. But the overall behavior of it, what is it? Well, it's positive because this maximum deviation is above zero. So this went up, this went up. Hence, demand shock, output and price go up. What about that supply shock that we're talking about? Well, if there's a supply shock to NyQuil, what would happen? Well, okay, well, the quantity goes up. So how do we know that? Well, look at the vertical axis, right? This is, these are positive numbers here. The maximum response to a supply shock of NyQuil occurs a couple days after, and, okay, it's what, 0.0... 0.0035% above steady state. What does the price do? When is the, the largest price response? Well, let's look here. Okay, so these are negative numbers. Negative 0. 0.00005, negative 0. 0.00015. Okay, so these numbers are negative. So it drops. The price of NyQuil drops, and yet it begins to increase. So you'd be like, well, doesn't that mean the price increases? No. The initial response is that it drops, and then it returns to steady state but the initial response is that it drops. And this would be indicative of a supply shock. Why? The price goes down, the quantity or the output goes up. So if price and output move in the same direction, demand shock. If they move in opposite directions, supply shock. Okay, so interpreting these shocks, really just kind of a refresher on what I just explained. So the demand shock, Output and price both increase on impact. Now, the impact is at that T equals zero. At T equals zero, there's an increase. And then it increases a little bit more and kind of starts to taper off. But the important part is they increase. So they begin to fall over time, yes, but it doesn't mean that they're falling on impact. I'm asking about what happens during impact. So the green curve, it's like that flat line leading up to t equals zero. And at t equals zero, the shock hits and they go up. Now it can increase or decrease after the shock, but I'm primarily interested in what happens on impact. So make sure that you look along that vertical axis at t equals zero to see if it's going up or down. If it's above zero, it's increasing on impact. If it's below zero, it's decreasing on impact. Now the behavior following the impact, okay, well, we, we, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I'm primarily interested, hence what's in bold here, primarily interested, and in what happens on impact. So this increases on impact. Quantity increases on impact here for the supply shock, and the price decreases on impact. So feel free to look through this again um, and see what you think. Um, you'll have a little bit of homework at some point going over this. And if you have any questions, obviously you can just message me. We can talk about it. So... Thanks for watching this. There's going to be another video coming up that will explain, well, this plus a little bit more. So thanks for watching, and there will be more coming later today.